Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Central webinar. This is Bill Voorhees, your host. I'm the Editorial Director with Data Science Central and also Chief Data Scientist for Data Magnum. So I'd like to start off our event today by thanking Crowdflower for sponsoring today's event. Crowdflower is a longtime supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we're honored to have them sponsoring our event today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Databricks, Tableau, IBM, Alteryx, SciSense, and Click, to name just a few. Now, past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to view them, I encourage you to take a look. They provide very useful insight into a wide variety of topics of interest to our data science community. Now, today's webinar is entitled Human in the Loop Deep Learning, and this is going to be presented by Crowdflower. But before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format for today's webinar. Today's event will be an hour long. Uh, we have one presenter that I'll introduce in just a minute. There'll be 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A following the presentation. And this event is being recorded and will be available on datasciencecentral.com later this afternoon following today's live event. Now, I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. We'll be reviewing and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Robert Monroe, uh, with Crowdflower. Now, Robert is an expert in combining human and machine intelligence, working with machine learning approaches to text, speech, image, and video processing. Robert's founded several AI companies, building some of the top teams in artificial intelligence. He's worked in many diverse environments from Sierra Leone, Haiti, and the Amazon, to London, Sydney, and Silicon Valley, in organizations ranging from startups to the United Nations. He most recently ran product for AWS's first natural language processing services in the deep learning team at Amazon AI. Now, Robert's published more than 50 papers and is a regular speaker about technology in an increasingly connected world. He has a PhD from Stanford University. Well, Robert, thanks for being with us today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Now, AI systems need to be continually learning from new data to perform well in real-world scenarios. However, it's non-trivial to decide what new data needs to be labeled for training and what is the best workflow uh, and user interface for providing human feedback. This critical component of machine learning is called active learning, and it's often absent from machine learning courses. So in today's Data Science Central webinar, uh, we'll extend TensorFlow's deep learning functionality with several active learning strategies and apply these to the well-known ImageNet computer vision data set. So at the end of this webinar, you should be comfortable with combining your data annotation and machine learning strategies to continually improve your training data at scale. So Robert, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, you can begin as soon as you're ready to go. All right. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here at Data Science Central today. And thank you, everyone, who is joining us uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, so but before we jump in, I'd love just to get an idea of the kind of, of people who are joining us today. So we have a, a few short poll questions, and then we'll get into the webinar itself. So you better see these on your screen. Um, I'll go through them one at a time. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is, your primarily, uh, what is your primary job role? Is it data science, IT, uh, working line of business, or you're a researcher or a student? Okay, and it looks like most of you are coming from a, a data science background, uh, either as a practicing data scientist or a researcher and a student interested in this area. So I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, talk for you. Uh, second, uh, how advanced are your organization's current machine learning efforts? Is this something that's used extensively? You're just getting started in it. You're planning or evaluating machine learning. Um, or you're just here today to educate yourself on this topic.
Okay, wow, um, a real mix of um, answers there. Um, uh, very few people have planned in or, or evaluated, so it looks like everyone's getting started or, or they're um, already using machine learning. Okay, so uh, thanks for filling out that, those poll results. It sounds like we've got um, a really interesting mix of people in the audience today, uh, with most of you already using machine learning um, in, in some way or another. Uh, so I think this is going to be a very interesting topic as, as we'll get into it. Uh, so, human in the loop processing uh, consists of everything from the machine learning algorithm choice, uh, the feedback loop in order to uh, provide the right data for humans to review, and the user interfaces themselves. That middle component, providing the right data for humans to review, is pretty much that the most complicated component of human in the loop processing, um, and it's known as active learning uh, in academic circles. So the majority of today's talk is going to be focused on active learning, uh, how active learning is specifically applied in the context of recent deep learning advances, um, but then we'll also touch on other aspects uh, such as what kind of interfaces should you be using for active learning. Um, so what is active learning? It's selecting the optimal data to manually label for machine learning. Why is it important? Um, as many of you who are already in the industry will know, selecting the right data can increase accuracy more than the algorithm in a lot of use cases. Uh, I've certainly seen a lot of use cases in industry where you might spend many months tuning your algorithms for a couple of percent increase in accuracy, but just a couple of hours of new data labeling for your training data will get even greater increases in accuracy, maybe uh, 10 to 20 percent. Um, but it's often overlooked. Um, so while active learning in, in some component is used pretty much everywhere in industry, it's in less than 5 percent of academic papers. One of the goals of today's webinar is to address this gap in um, the information that's available out there. At a very, very high level, uh, for those of you who haven't encountered active learning before, uh, the process looks something like this. Optimally selecting the manual label for machine learning, and when implemented well, it's often a continuous feedback loop. Um, so you can imagine that here you are, you have the task in hand where you want to do uh, image identification and you want to identify pictures of cats. You're asking your machine learning algorithm to identify pictures of cats, and you're given it as an example. Um, in reality, you'd be given thousands, or ideally tens of thousands of examples, not just one. This is obviously simplified here. And then active learning is when your machine learning algorithm, or a set of algorithms working with your machine learning algorithm, is able to choose which ambiguous items are the right ones for a human to provide feedback on. Uh, so in this example here, you can see the machine learning algorithm has identified a tiger and a kitten. Um, so these are obviously maybe not prototypical cats, maybe not similar to the, the thousands that were provided initially. And so it was the humans who either confirm or deny that these are cats, provide that information back, and then that machine learning algorithm is able to get smarter or faster. The reason that this is important is that human resources are limited. And so it's, we need to work out what is the right data to focus on. So you could imagine that there are millions and millions of potential cat pictures that might go through your machine learning algorithm, and you can't put all of those millions in front of a human for review. And so the, the task of active learning is to select among all these possible candidates which are the, the right ones to put in front of a human for review, and what is the right order for them um, to be put in front of a human for review. Uh, so uh, you get two benefits here. Uh, one is that you get to take advantage of the limited human resources in the most optimal way. Um, so you, the machine learning algorithm is getting uh, as smart as it can uh, from a limited amount of, of human input. Uh, the other is prioritization. You're putting the, the most important items in front of the human for review first. Uh, and this was uh, the, the area that I first came from in active learning. Uh, so I was first using active learning working in disaster response scenarios. Uh, trying to pull out uh, critical information following sudden onset disasters uh, so that disaster response responders uh, could focus on what was the most important and actionable information first. Uh, so you can see in a situation like this, following a disaster where you might have millions of communications coming out of that region, it's really important to uh, put those most important pieces of information in front of the people first. Uh, and then also with that uh, people's response, uh, be able to update your machine learning algorithms accordingly to better filter that most important data. As for why active learning is overlooked, uh, we can see this when we look at ACM papers for AI-related terms. 
Um, so we'll share these links in, in the follow-up uh, so you can have a look at this for yourself. But if you search for different terms across uh, recent ACM papers, you'll see that artificial intelligence occurs in about 60,000 papers. Machine learning occurs in about 25,000 papers. But active learning only occurs in about 1,000 papers. Uh, and so for those of you who have taken online courses or undergraduate or even graduate level machine learning courses or programs, you've probably seen this yourself. And you've certainly learned a lot about the algorithms that underlie especially supervised machine learning, uh, but maybe you had at most one class uh, which looked at the process for uh, selecting the right training data and how to annotate that training data. And uh, the algorithms that, and the math that goes into selecting the right data for active learning are, are just as complicated as, as those with supervised machine learning and in many cases come from the, the same suite of statistics. Uh, however, just for historical reasons, this did not become part of the science um, uh, and, and to this day we're still seeing this gap. And so that's why we're really happy to have uh, all of you joining us here today uh, because I'd say pretty much everyone in industry at some point has looked at the output of their machine learning model and, and made a, a decision based on that about what additional data to annotate, which means everyone's performed active learning um, in at least an ad hoc fashion. Um, but you get the, the biggest benefit from active learning when you're doing it in, in a more principled and easier to, to measure way. So background for today, we're going to be looking at one data set and, and one well-known technology that I'm sure many of you are familiar with already. Uh, so the ImageNet data set and TensorFlow. I'll introduce them both briefly for, uh, for all of you who haven't seen those already and a refresher for those who have. So ImageNet is a, a very large set of images where each image is labeled for uh, one of a large number of categories. Uh, the canonical ImageNet data set has about 1 million images in total labeled for about 1,000 categories. And uh, these categories or labels uh, come from a WordNet uh, hierarchy of terms. Uh, so WordNet is actually a linguistic resource, not an image resource. It's dividing up all the, the words, in this case in the English language, although it is available in other languages, into a, a hierarchy of terms. So as you can see in, in the screenshot here, and, and I do encourage you to, to explore this um, because I think it's just inherently really interesting, you can see that uh, within ImageNet there is a category called sports, comma, athletics. Uh, so in, in WordNet, sports and athletics are considered uh, synonyms, and therefore these are known as a thin set. Within sports and athletics, there is a subclass called athletic game. There's a further subclass called a, a court game. And then you can see the subclasses of, of court game, or others as the hyperdims on the, the right. Uh, so you've got things like tennis and, and badminton there uh, with those images. Well, uh, WordNet and, and therefore ImageNet is a hierarchy in, in this sense. Most people do tend to use ImageNet as a flat classification task uh, across these uh, thousand categories. And uh, for most of today, uh, in this webinar, we'll do the same. Although uh, in more advanced techniques, you can take adva advantage of this hierarchy. And that's something that we'll return to at the end when we cover some of the more advanced active learning techniques. TensorFlow is an open machine learning library, perhaps the uh, most well-known open machine learning library uh, for deep learning. Uh, it has a, a large number of different algorithms and tools for machine learning, uh, which uh, you can use in, in various combinations. Uh, today we're going to use one of the, the most well-known models. It's actually a pre-trained deep learning model, an inception model for ImageNet. Um, uh, so uh, TensorFlow is open source, and this pre-trained model ships with the, the open source distribution. So everything that we're doing here today is based on existing open source code uh, that you'll be able to, to reproduce at home uh, no matter uh, what kind of uh, platform that you're running on. Uh, I'm not going to go uh, too deep into deep learning models, no pun intended, um, uh, today. Um, but if you're not familiar with deep learning, it's just one important concept uh, about the architectures of deep learning models uh, for this particular webinar. And um, that's that deep learning models for supervised learning like this are a, a series of layers um, in an architected network where each of those layers is a further refinement from raw pixels to the target label. Um, so for a, a really good paper on this, I, I recommend having a look at uh, Zilla and Focus's paper on ImageNet. Um, certainly there's been a lot of uh, advances on deep learning for ImageNet over the years, perhaps more for, than for any other image um, processing uh, data set. However, I think this particular paper is the most intuitive uh, for people coming to it for the first time uh, because they, they produce these visualizations of what the different layers look like. 
Uh, so the, the key takeaway here is that that first layer, you can see it's, it's pretty much abstract shapes. So this is probably the first layer of the model learning things like the edges of, of objects in an image. In the, the second layer, you can see that they're starting to, uh, uh, to uncover parts of objects that, that looks like it probably could be leaf petals in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, and then you can see in the third layer here, you're starting to see recognizable objects. So in, in the bottom middle, uh, these are uh, human faces. The bottom left are, are pumpkins, I think, or things that look like pumpkins. Um, and then you can see what looks like mostly car wheels, uh, just about that. Um, and so in that, that, that third layer, you start to have what look like meaningful objects in, in the real world clustered together. Uh, so that's something that we'll come back to in, in some of the more advanced techniques later. Uh, most importantly, uh, you just need to understand that the TensorFlow model uh, is a, a prediction uh, uh, supervised learning model, uh, just like any other that you would encounter. So for any of you who used supervised learning before, this output should look very familiar. Uh, let's say we have a, a new photograph, one that's not in the ImageNet training data, uh, and we want to apply the TensorFlow model to predict what's in that photograph. This is what the output would look like. Um, so it's a, a set of confidences on the, the different labels in ImageNet. Uh, so what this means is that when we give this photograph to our, our predictive model, it's saying that, well, I'm 90% confident that this is a picture of a canoe. Uh, I'm 4% confident that it's a paddle, a boat paddle, uh, less than 1% confident that it's a gondola, et cetera. And so you can see that um, all of these are sensible answers, uh, and that is correct with the top one uh, with fairly high confidence. Uh, so for all of the, the examples today, we're going to be using a, uh, a data set that's already also open source that you'll be able to, to download and provide the link on sports-related images. So you can think of this as a use case where you have a client that's very interested in sports and they want to um, extend the ImageNet uh, training data um, to focus on the different kind of sports that it cares about, so it has more accuracy around them. Uh, this is a, a really common uh, use case that, that we see in industry. Uh, people want to take uh, some sort of existing model or ontology um, and extend or adapt it to their particular business needs. So active learning. Uh, so we'll go through a, a number of methods about how to decide what humans should review um, uh, in order to add new labels to, to update the machine learning algorithms. Um, broadly, we want to, to maximize uh, two things. Uh, we want to make the humans as efficient as possible, so use as little as their time as possible. Um, and we also want to identify the different areas in which the machine learning algorithm might be confused, uh, because these are the areas which are going to provide the most value uh, when we add new labels uh, to those kinds of images. Uh, and if you'd like to play around with this yourself, uh, we have a starter code uh, up on my GitHub account. Um, so it has um, working code. Uh, in the form of a coding assignment. In fact, this is a, a coding assignment I've, I've used for interviews um, in the past. Uh, so it's, it's working code right now uh, with instructions for uh, how you might want to extend it for the different kinds of strategies uh, that we're going to cover here. Again, we'll, we'll share this uh, link in, in a follow-up, um, and you're welcome to um, try everything that, that we're doing here in this seminar at home. Uh, so the most important thing to find for active learning are ambiguous items. Uh, so the ImageNet set of labels are mutually exclusive, which means that if we have two predictions with similar confidence, this is showing that, that the model is, is confused. So looking at this photograph here, it's predicting with about 37% confidence that this is a photograph of volleyball and about 32% confidence that this is a, a photograph of a balance beam. And uh, I actually do not know what sport this is. <laughs> Maybe you do. Um, but I can say for sure that it's neither volleyball nor balance beam. Uh, so the fact that our machine learning model um, had two top predictions with very similar confidence, uh, it's telling us that um, there is obviously uh, some sort of confusion here. Uh, so this would be a good candidate for what, what you might put in front of a human for review. So the, the standard way then uh, to uh, rank ambiguous items for human review would, to be, uh, would be to look at the ratio between these two sets of confidences. Um, so to uh, divide uh, 36.9 by 32.2, um, and then uh, across all your predictions, rank order uh, according to that ratio with the, the most ambiguous, so where there's a, the least difference between them uh, first. On a related but um, slightly different way to look at the data, uh, you can also pull out low confidence items. 
uh, if you have a multi-class problem, um, uh, then uh, this might be the only strategy available to you uh, looking purely at confidence. So look at this photograph here of the uh, sun in a beautiful sky. Um, the top prediction only has 11.2% confidence. So this is really low. Uh, across the, the thousands of labels in ImageNet, our machine learning model wasn't really able to make a confident prediction about where this would fit in. And again, you can see that the, the guesses it made so are reasonable. Um, so it's the highest guess that it's a parachute. And there's obviously no parachute here, but as it's a, a photograph of the sky, you can reasonably imagine that most parachutes ImageNet has seen are in the sky. Um, similarly for, for wing, cliff, and balloon beneath that. And geyser, perhaps it thinks that this is a reflection of the sky in, in deep water. Um, but certainly the fact that all of these are very low in confidence is, again, good evidence uh, that the machine learning model is, um, is confused here. And you'll see that in some of the most naive um, but often effective approaches to active learning look only at, look at confidence, uh, putting those in front of humans for review first. Finally, among the, the top three methods, and, and most importantly, uh, it, you should always be putting randomly selected items in front of humans for a review. Uh, so any active learning strategy, by definition, is biasing your data. You're not selecting uh, random samples of data for humans to review. Um, you're biasing it according to your, your model output. And what that means is that if you evaluate on biased data, you're not actually getting an, an accurate indication of your accuracy across the, um, the entire data set. Uh, so while you can and most often should be biasing what goes into your training data, uh, for your held out evaluation data where you're evaluating your accuracy, um, this should uh, pretty much always consist only of randomly selected items. There's also an additional benefit here, and I'll, I'll talk more about this as we get into the advanced, um, the advanced responses, of um, randomly selected items can also pull out things which are um, wrong but confidently wrong. Um, so with the, the last two methods that I demonstrated, um, you're always looking at low confidence items. Um, but as you can imagine, actually, the, the most valuable item uh, to get the correct label for is um, not something that the model is ambiguous about. It's something that the model is confident about, but it has got wrong. Um, and you can see why in, in this uh, example here, why the model got it wrong. Uh, so here's two players playing rugby on the beach. And the most confident answer is, is volleyball. And the fact that it's on the beach, it looks like they're wearing volleyball clothes. Uh, someone's diving in the way that they might for a volleyball. It seems like a perfectly reasonable answer. Uh, but in fact, that, that ball tells you that they're, they're playing rugby, not volleyball. And uh, I think it's, it's great that the model had this as the, the second most accurate response. Uh, but certainly, it's, it's a long way for being the correct top response here. And it's, uh, it's often difficult um, uh, to uh, know when you are confidently wrong, because uh, by definition, your, your model is, is getting this wrong. And so this is one of the ways you always want to, one of the reasons that you always want to select uh, random items uh, for evaluation and to make sure you get the coverage for examples like this. Uh, so moving into to advanced techniques, uh, the more advanced techniques for uh, active learning are all trying to solve this problem of how can we discover items where our model is confidently wrong. And you'll often uh, see this coming down to looking at the, the trade-off between confidence and coverage in active learning. How can we make sure we have the, the right coverage uh, across all of our data, irrespective of the, the model? Uh, so uh, there's two I'll talk about here. Uh, the first is uh, clustering or unsupervised learning. So uh, this is normally more intuitive in, in something like text analysis um, rather than in uh, image analysis. So if you're doing active learning for text and you want to make sure that you have a broad variety of items that you're putting in front of humans for review, you could apply clustering. So let's say across your sports images, 95% of these images happen to be about basketball. Um, you don't want your humans to spend 95% of their time just adjudicating basketball. That's actually not very good um, variety. Uh, so if you, uh, in an unsupervised manner, uh, clustered um, all your items, um, then you might get one cluster with basketball, and you know, let's say you're doing 10 clusters, then nine other clusters with, with different kinds of sports. So you get more variety there. 
In the case of text, that's pretty easy because you can just use the words and phrases for, for clustering and that's fairly effective. Um, but with images, uh, simply using the pixels uh, is not so effective. The, the pixels tend to be too abstracted uh, from that, the real meaning. And so um, if you remember back to that, uh, that, deep, learning, uh, that deep learning model, uh, that's uh, second to last layer or like one of the near last layers, you can see there that the objects um, are fairly meaningful. So this is where we have things like, like pumpkins, car tires, um, uh, people, etc. cetera. Um, so if you have a look at that starter code that we shared, uh, you can actually just with changing one line of code access um, that second to last layer in the model. And what that means is that you can then perform completely unsupervised clustering uh, based on objects which appear to be more like real world objects. And it's not completely unbiased uh, because that's still the, the second last layer in, in the model that you've built for this particular task. <clears throat> but it will be more abstracted from uh, simply looking at the, um, uh, the final 1,000 categories of image outputs. And so that's something I encourage you to, to play around with if you're going to um, uh, go away and start using the code. Uh, the, uh, another advanced technique that you can use is external resources. Uh, so as you recall, um, WordNet is a hierarchy. Uh, and especially in the, the natural language processing community, uh, there's a lot of literature about looking at the, the distance in the hierarchy um, as a good indication of things which uh, should be semantically different. So if we look at this picture on the right, which is part of a motorcycle, uh, we can see that the, the top two responses are lawnmower and crash helmet. Uh, lawnmower is 44% confident, and in the context of image that's actually fairly confident. Um, so by the other techniques, this probably wouldn't be a candidate for, for something that we would put in front of a human for review. Um, however, you know intuitively that a lawnmower and a crash helmet are very different things. Um, and you know, obviously you can, you can see why it made these guesses. Um, so at first glance, the, the shape of the red object on the left, that could be a lawnmower. And it could also be a crash helmet, and maybe the, the context of motorcycle parts um, uh, make the model uh, predicted in, in that fashion. However, if you would go into to WordNet, you would see that um, a crash helmet would uh, go into sporting equipment and, and up through a, a large number of steps in parents and, until it got to uh, man-made objects. Uh, same to lawnmower. Um, so it would go up through gardening equipment and, and possibly other kinds of hierarchies, <coughs> meaning that these are very distant cousins in the, the WordNet hierarchy. Uh, and so uh, rather than, for example, confusing squash and racquetball, um, which are next to each other in the hierarchy and it's reasonable to confuse, um, confusing lawnmower and crash helmet would be evidence that uh, the model is much further from uh, reality. And if you are interested in this, I encourage you to look at uh, the NLTK Python library. Uh, it has a lot of the, um, the distant, metric, distant metrics for WordNet um, already built into it. This is something you could plug into a model and, and play around with fairly quickly. Uh, like everything, uh, there are exceptions uh, to the approaches that you might want to uh, take for active learning. Um, and these will come down to uh, uh, your data um, and potentially uh, the business use case. Um, so one, uh, especially for those uh, first three uh, use cases that, that I showed, looking at ambiguous items, looking at low confidence items, and selecting random items, uh, what would be the case if only low items are, are all in the same class? Uh, so to build on that, that current example, imagine that everything that was low confidence or ambiguous happened to be pictures of squash and racquetball uh, because that they look really, really similar to each other. It's not going to be a good use of your human resources if they're only looking at pictures of, of squash and racquetball um, and ignoring uh, potential improvements elsewhere in your data. Uh, and this is something that I've actually encountered fairly commonly in industry. Um, across whatever task you're doing, uh, some of the labels will just be inherently ambiguous in the real world, um, and you want to make sure that you don't uh, just focus on those when you put them in front of humans. Um, so one solution here, um, other than selecting random items, which obviously will get you the variety, um, is to use those and labels uh, to ensure that you get more variety. Uh, so um, as much as possible across those thousand labels, whatever's the most confident, um, making sure you're, you're sampling equally across um, those most predictive labels um, rather than equally across all of the data. Uh, related to this, you might care, it should be about, you might care about some types of labels um, more than others. Um, <clears throat> so again, in, in this use case of sports, imagine that the majority of these photographs were, were not related to sports at all. And this is um, an ad adaptation of ImageNet that you're making for a sports company. Uh, so 
you might want to look at the most confident prediction, um, but then only for some very small number, which are predicted to be not sports related, put those in front of the human for review. Um, and make sure that you're only putting the, um, uh, the most valuable ones in front of humans for review. <clears throat> uh, as with uh, any of the other techniques um, that we've uh, spoken about today, um, we certainly want to make sure that we are not uh, introducing bias to our model. Um, so to the extent that you are um, introducing uh, more sophisticated and more biasing active learning techniques or that you're introducing exceptions um, in order to meet uh, your business objectives, um, it then becomes even more important that you have a, um, a good, large enough selection of randomly sampled items that allows you to continue to uh, evaluate your accuracy. Uh, so finally today, we'll talk a little bit about interfaces for, for human in the loop processing. Human in the loop um, processing, like we said at the start, covers everything from the selection of machine learning models uh, to active learning for selecting the, the right items for humans to review, uh, and then the interfaces and quality control methods for providing that human feedback. Uh, uh, I won't be covering today uh, quality control for human feedback. Um, uh, this is something that we um, specialize in um, here at Crowdflow and, and something that we'd be um, happy to, to demonstrate later. Uh, but today I will talk about uh, what you need to think about as you are building interfaces based on active learning feedback. Um, so uh, the interface between um, machine learning and humans. And I think this is the, uh, the most important problem that we are currently solving in technology. You know, what does the interface between humans and AI look like in order for humans to evaluate AI's performance and provide it the, the most accurate feedback? And this really is a nascent science. If, if active learning was only um, 1,000 um, of uh, those papers compared to the 50,000 for all of AI, um, I imagine that there's less than a couple of dozen papers specifically focusing on um, human-computer interaction um, for providing AI feedback. Um, and hopefully this is something that we'll, we'll see more academic work focus on in the near future because, uh, like I said, I think this, this really is the, the most important problem that we are trying to solve in computer science and also uh, the most interesting right? because it really does bring in aspects of human cognition, artificial intelligence, uh, and user experience. So, uh, there are a couple of trade-offs to consider um, when building interfaces for humans to provide feedback. Uh, one is that more repetitive work is faster, but more error-prone uh, due to boredom. So going back to, to that example where it, it might have been a lawnmower, or it might not have been, you can imagine that if you had a, a lot of images of lawnmowers one after each other, and you were simply asking uh, the, the human worker, is this a lawnmower, yes or no, in that interface, and they're clicking yes, 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 you could very easily prime them to mistakenly view that image as a lawnmower because they've been hitting yes so often. So they're, they're going to be able to get through that task a lot faster, um, but they're likely to get bored quicker as well. Um, and depending on how that, that human is, is motivated, they can even walk away from your job. If this is um, someone in your lab or someone who's, who's not getting paid by, by the hour, um, this boring work could seem uh, repetitive to them and it not be a good user experience and that it wouldn't be clear to them how that they're impacting the machine learning algorithm that everything is the same. Uh, and this will lead to more errors. Um, it's uh, much more likely that you'll get uh, quality results from humans if the, uh, the work is constantly changing. So for example, if they're looking at a picture and it says, is this a lawnmower? And then the, the next picture says, is this basketball? And then the next one says, is this baseball? Um, and so by uh, forcing someone to cognitively um, uh, switch their context uh, with every photograph, they're going to pay a lot more attention to this work. Um, and so you're going to get more accurate results. Um, however, uh, the trade-off in, in with that cognitive switching uh, is going to be a lot slower. Um, so you'd expect this to be at least 2x slower. slower. Uh, so these are some of the trade-offs uh, that you need to think about purely in, in terms of uh, the order of items that you're putting in front of your human for review. Uh, in a little bit more sophisticated fashion, you need to think about the right workflows as well. Uh, so what is the best interface uh, to get unbiased data uh, for evaluation? Uh, so again, going back to the, the motorcycle versus lawnmower uh, example, uh, you could ask someone, is this, a, is this a lawnmower, yes or no? But you still might be getting that bias because you've asked them about a lawnmower. You put them in the context of, of um, garden items. 
And uh, you can unbias this by simply asking them what is in this image. Uh, so the same way that you would have collected the training data to begin with before you're performing active learning. And then giving them uh, the option to select from those uh, thousand image net categories. But again, as I'm sure you can imagine, selecting from among a thousand image net categories is, is going to be a, a long task. Um, you can't just select that much from a flat menu, perhaps it's hierarchical, there's going to be decisions there. So it's certainly going to be a, a lot, um, a much longer process uh, to get someone uh, to select across all possible um, uh, labels uh, rather than getting them to, to answer that yes, no question. So again, this is something you need to think about in, in terms of uh, the trade-off uh, between someone clicking yes, no, and someone selecting from the menu. And typically this, this difference is going to be something like 10x. Um, so you might even, um, depending on, on the use case, you might even decide that you're okay uh, with those additional errors um, uh, because you are getting 10 times as many training data. And slightly noisy uh, data, but 10 times larger, um, will be better um, than having completely clean but smaller training data. Uh, and that's something that you're just going to have to, as a data, science, uh, data scientist, uh, evaluate for your particular um, uh, use case. Um, and then moving into even more uh, sophisticated techniques, uh, what's the, the fastest interface to get human verification on uh, confident model predictions? Um, so uh, again, uh, another really interesting uh, potential interface here would be with the, um, uh, the lawnmower motorcycle example. Uh, so imagine you had uh, 20 pictures of, uh, of lawnmowers and you were confident that all of these were, were lawnmowers. You certainly um, don't want to go through and have someone click yes 19 times and then ho hopefully they get that, that uh, the one that's wrong. So this is the, the problem with repetitive work, um, which, is, which is error prone and, and, um, and boring. Um, however, you could have a slightly different interface where you have the pictures of all 20 lawnmowers up there on the screen and you just ask them, like, which ones of these are not lawnmowers? Um, uh, so cognitively, uh, this is a much better task. Uh, everything is there to begin with, and they're, they're trying to pull out the odd one out uh, from the entire group, uh, not in a sequence where they can be primed. And then um, uh, some more sophisticated uh, methods for, for quality control, uh, you could see um, these 20. So you could always put in one or two images um, uh, that you know not to be about lawnmowers. Uh, so if someone is looking at 20 images at a time, um, they're already expecting something like one to three non-lawnmowers. Um, and uh, with the ones that happen to be wrong, uh, they're more likely to be pulled out. Um, so as you can see then, this is a way that, that's not biased in them. Um, so if, uh, this is a way that you can make sure uh, if you have high confidence items um, that you're still able to get a human review on those um, and you're getting your data through much faster. Um, so uh, you'll certainly see a lot of case industry as well where you will want a human review on every single item. Uh, even at the highest of confidence, uh, in some use cases, you simply don't want to trust your machine learning model. Um, and so by getting batch human evaluations uh, in this manner um, and, and making sure they're not repetitive, um, you're able to, again, get 10x, uh, 20, uh, 20x increase in, um, in efficiency um, from your human evaluators. So if you're interested to, to know more about uh, interfaces for this particular task, uh, which, like I said, could be an, an hour in its own right, uh, another webinar. And if you are interested in a webinar in, in this topic, please let us know. Um, there is data code for this as well. Um, uh, so it's just a um, repo on, on GitHub to the other one. Um, this is working data code showing an interface for providing new annotations uh, to the output of that TensorFlow model for ImageNet on that sports data. Again, with instructions about different ways in which you might want to build out those interfaces. So this is something that you can experiment with at home and, and see what, uh, what's working well for you. Uh, so that's, that's it for the core topics today. Uh, I just want to um, make everybody an offer as well. Uh, if you're interested in uh, getting a trial for, for Crowdflower's uh, technology for, for human in the loop processing and, and data annotation, uh, we'll send a follow-up email. Uh, please reply, reply to that. Um, and we will give you a free T-shirt uh, like this one that, that I am uh, modeling here. Um, so we'd uh, love to talk to you if you want to learn more about this topic and um, how our technology can help with that. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll thank you all for attending today. And I'll, I'll pass this back to, to Bill to moderate our questions. Thank you, Bill. Well, Robert, hey, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Uh, and we'll get started with today's Q&A session. Uh, I want to thank the audience for their participation. We've had a lot of questions. 
that have come in during your presentation. And so we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time remaining. And uh, during this Q&A session, I'll leave up this screen with contact information for Robert if you'd like to get a hold of him following today's webinar. So let's get started. So Robert, it, it appears that uh, the user interface uh, that I design in order to get uh, human in the loop uh, interactive learning is, is maybe the most important part of this process. How do I judge uh, which of my various human interface approaches is going to be the most accurate? That's a great question. Yeah, certainly you, you want to make sure that you get the right inter interface, uh, both for throughput and accuracy. Um, so I guess the question here is around accuracy. Uh, and in this case, you want to make sure that you're judging this in more or less the same criteria that you're judging uh, supervised machine learning models. Uh, so you want to, to hold out uh, some data that you're already confident that is annotated correctly. Uh, there's different ways that you might do that. You might have in-house experts. You might look for um, instances of very high agreement between people to indicate that something is, is accurate. Um, but you should also try to ensure that you have a, a random sample. Um, and then once you have uh, what's known as gold examples in uh, the annotation parlance, uh, then you can test your different interfaces. Uh, so with uh, different sections of your, your workforce, uh, you can give one one interface, give one another interface, and you can look at uh, the same kind of stats that you would look for your machine learning model. What was the, uh, the precision, recall, and F measure, F measure, other forms of accuracy um, across uh, your, human, um, your human judgments? Um, and yeah, just a flag as well, while you were asking about accuracy, you certainly do want to look at that, that accuracy uh, throughput trade-off, um, because there might be cases where if it really is 10x increase in throughput, um, you're okay um, uh, with some loss in accuracy. Well, Robert, thank you for that answer. Uh, now, most of the questions that have come in are fairly technical in nature, but there is one that's particularly foundational. So maybe we'll start there. Uh, and, and it's a very straight, quite straightforward question about, you know, how is active learning different than basically supervised learning? Great, yeah, yeah, wonderful question. So. Active learning, um, in terms of supervised learning, can be thought of as uh, the process by which you are adding more data to your supervised learning model. Um, so uh, supervised learning is taking a, a preset number of uh, human-labeled images, and uh, typically human-labeled images, or um, in this case, or human-labeled items, and uh, building a model to make predictions uh, according to whatever the, the label or process was that it learned from. Um, active learning um, is then uh, that next loop. It's that loop that's going back from the machine to the human uh, in order to um, uh, put in front of those humans the, the most important items for review. Okay, well, Robert, thank you for that clarification. Now, to move on, uh, many of the examples that you talked about, or I guess all of the examples you talked about had to do with image, uh, but this applies equally to text, and that must be a little different. Can you can you speak to the issue of the differences between active learning in image and text situations? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, almost everything I, I showed here today uh, would apply equally to, to text and image processing, and and that was um, uh, somewhat by design. Um, there are certainly some. Uh, some techniques that you might apply in active learning, like transfer learning, which historically have worked really well on images and not so well in text. Uh, but for everything I showed here today, um, looking at ambiguous items, looking at low confidence items, um, uh, trying to, to cluster to find uh, the right variety of things to put in front of humans for review, uh, this would apply equally to, to text, speech, and video data as it would to the image data that we went through in our example. Well, thank you. Thanks for that answer. Now, uh, obviously, some of the folks that are online are very deeply involved in this area. So um, the audience asks, uh, how would you contrast between active learning techniques and intelligent sampling techniques, such as importance sampling, differential sampling, uh, you know, which, which would perform better for a simple random sampling? Okay, yeah, all right, we, we have some people who know what they're talking about on I then. <laughs> um, so these different kinds of sampling techniques are, um, are exactly what we were demonstrating um, in 
uh, looking at different levels of competence, combining unsupervised learning. Um, and these different sampling techniques might take into account the machine learning output. Uh, they might take into account um, other uh, statistical properties of the uh, of what uh, of the the items, uh, just like we're looking at with clustering or some combination therein. Um, so in terms of uh, where they fit into active learning, uh, these would be different kinds of strategies that you might choose uh, to sample across your labels. Um, and then, uh, as with um, all of the techniques here, um, you would um, build these into your active learning uh, feedback loop um, and then uh, evaluate the resulting model from the different techniques uh, to work out which was the best in, um, uh, for your data set. Uh, as with everything in, in machine learning, there's no free lunch. Um, uh, different techniques are going to work different uh, for different uh, for different data sets uh, in different business contexts. Um, and so, either by trial and error, or if you're a little bit more sophisticated by by automated meta learning, um, you can choose uh, which of these techniques or which combination of theirs are going to be the best for your particular data set. Robert, thank you for that answer. Now, uh, if the if the classification problem is purely binary. Uh, how do you recommend identifying and prioritizing sampling for the human relabeling process? Right, yeah, the binary sets are often the, the easiest ones to, to work on. And, and the um, exclusive um, multi-class problem that I showed here is the second easiest. Uh, so the, the main difference if you're looking at a binary task is that um, ambiguous items are those with 50% confidence, um, so things which are at the, the decision boundary. Um, uh, and maybe with your data, um, that the prior is, is not 50, but most of the times it, it will be. Um, and so in that case, you're just looking at that single decision boundary for ambiguous items. Uh, and everything else still applies. Um, you're more likely um, to find misclassifications um, and confusion at that, at that decision boundary with, binary, uh, uh, with a binary classifier. Um, however, uh, the most valuable item to classify uh, is something still that is confidently classified from. Robert, thank you for that uh, that answer. Now, um, if uh, one of the tasks that uh, that we increasingly see in deep learning is adapting a, uh, a currently trained model uh, for more categories, so uh, how would you deal with a situation uh, if I wanted to create different categories for an existing model? Great question. Yes, that actually um, harks back to, to what I said a, a few answers ago with uh, transfer learning. Um, so the the process of taking a model that's been applied for that's been built for one task and adapting it to another task is, is known as transfer learning. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, it's been really hard to get transfer learning to work well in, in text data. Um, and so somewhat frustratingly, if, if you have a machine learning model uh, built on something like sentiment analysis for Yelp reviews, and then you try to apply it to sentiment analysis for uh, tweets, uh, you, Transfer learning will only really give you a couple of percent increase in accuracy. Uh, most of the time, you really just want to collect data and, and build that model from scratch uh, for the new use case. And that's in language. And that obviously doesn't even start to, to, to broach the, the problem of different languages. Um, so that would just be in English, for example. Um, by, uh, by contrast, uh, transfer learning is incredibly effective uh, for images. Um, I think this basically just comes down to the, the set of things that we have in images, which are objects in the real world for the most part, um, don't have that, that same variability against everything that, that can be expressed in, in language or across languages. Uh, so, um, yeah, if, if you're doing this for text data, um, uh, you could experiment with transfer learning uh, for research purposes, but um, uh, I would not expect success going in. However, if you're doing this for images, I would strongly suggest looking at, at transfer learning. Uh, two basic ways that you can do this, if you have a different set of categories and, and some existing training data, um, at your first layer, you can just input um, uh, the, uh, the output from another model. Um, so you're building training data purely around sports classification, for example, um, and in addition to the, the pixel level information from um, uh, your sports images going into your model, you're also putting, the, putting in the, the predictions from the um, uh, image that model, and there's different ways you can put those in, which we're not going to do here. Uh, that's the, the, the simplest way, um, and probably the most common way. Um, but if you, especially if you have a deep learning model, um, another technique that you can use uh, is just to retrain uh, the last layer of your model. 
Um, so if you recall back to that, uh, that photograph um, of the, the different levels of your machine learning model, um, when it goes from least to, um, uh, from more abstraction to, to least abstraction for predictions, you can take uh, some number of, of training data items and then retrain that just on the, the last layer of the model. And so what that means is that those early layers where it's doing things like edge detection and little components of, of objects, they, they remain unchanged. Um, but in terms of how it's putting those objects together in order to predict the labels, it's doing that on your new labels. And there's um, uh, uh, two places, uh, two reasons uh, that you would use uh, this technique rather than just building a new model. Um, one is if you don't have many training items. Uh, so if you have, you know, let's just say only a couple of thousand labeled examples in total for sports, um, then you're going to get more accuracy adapting that ImageNet model uh, because it's learned about objects in the world across a much larger data set, across more than a million. So retraining that last layer is probably going to be more accurate than trying to build a model from fresh across only 1,000 labels. Uh, the other is that it's quicker. Um, so if you want to re retrain just the, the last layer of that model, and by the way, there's a starter code for this in, um, in TensorFlow already, I believe, um, then it might only take you know, maybe a couple of minutes um, even, even on your personal computer to, to retrain that last layer uh, versus potentially seven days, eight days, you know, maybe a few weeks um, to, to retrain the entire model. Uh, so for active learning, uh, like what we're talking about today, uh, that can be really vital because that means that you can um, retrain the model really quickly, put those items uh, back for review in front of people much faster, um, and then retrain that, that last layer again. Uh, so making that, that human feedback loop much, much faster. Uh, so the, the intersection between transfer learning and, and active learning I think is incredibly exciting. Uh, it's something that, that I use a lot in my day to day. Um, so if people are interested in this, uh, this is certainly something that, that we could also do a seminar on. Uh, this is something that, that we could talk about for at least an hour. Yeah, that, that is a very interesting area of exploration and, and obviously going to be very important moving forward in terms of efficiency. Now, uh, specifically, uh, it appears that in active learning, as we feed these corrected items back into the, uh, the training set, uh, the audience asks, um, does this create the potential for biasing the neural net uh, to the most recent items that it saw? Yeah, it, it absolutely does. Um, it'll, it'll depend on how you retrain the network. Um, uh, whether you're not, you get your, um, uh, you're going to get order and effects. Um, but by definition, um, uh, active learning is, is a process of biasing your model, um, which is why you'll always want to uh, randomly sample uh, for your evaluation data and ideally for, for your uh, validation data as well, if you're splitting your, your validation and your, your test data. Um, uh, I like that you, uh, the other question was brought up about uh, most recent items as well. Uh, we didn't cover it today, but I, another um, compelling reason to use active learning is when you know that your, your data is moving around a lot, um, that, that the domain is shifting, the nature of the data is shifting. Um, and you can imagine any real world scenario where, where this, this would apply. So we're looking at sports data, um, so with the, the Baseball World Cup coming up, you know, I would imagine we see a lot more baseball related uh, photographs uh, coming in if you're looking at web data, for example, or social media data. Um, so again, uh, uh, domain adaptation um, or concept drift um, is uh, a big topic that, that we could spend an hour on. Um, and but certainly a, it's another reason that you would want to um, apply active learning. Um, and then uh, if you are getting a effect that you think are temporal, um, uh, there's a lot of methods um, in terms of uh, weighting more recent items um, uh, so you can adapt quicker. Um, although in implementation, you often see this called discounting. Um, so rather than weighted more recent items, you lower the weight of um, items which are older. Makes sense. Robert, thank you for that, uh, that answer. Now, uh, an audience member uh, focused on you talking about clustering as a technique during the presentation and asks, uh, wouldn't that be very computationally expensive uh, if there's a huge amount of data? It can be. It can be. Uh, clustering, uh, it really depends on the algorithm that, that you're choosing. So there are online clustering algorithms which, which can do reasonably well with one pass over the data, um, so they're incredibly efficient, um, through to uh, deep learning based clustering methods which may well take weeks um, uh, to, uh, 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 to optimize, uh, to converge uh, over your data. 
Uh, and so one of the nice things here is that um, uh, clustering for, for selecting a broad selection of data for active learning, it can be pretty rough. Uh, you're really just trying to, to do better than um, um, completely um, unbalanced, uh, unbiased data. Um, and so uh, it's been my experience that the differences between, you know, a, a one-minute and a one-week clustering algorithm um, in terms of selecting a variety of data for active learning is, is not very large. Uh, it's certainly something that could be experimented with. Uh, I'm not even aware of any academic papers um, which have, have really uh, looked at this problem in depth. I'd, I'd love for someone to study it. Um, but certainly I, I would recommend that if you, you are looking to, to get um, uh, the most semantic variety in your data for active learning, at least start with uh, some of the simpler clustering methods and, and see how they go first. Well, interesting. Well, and thank you for that observation. Now, uh, one of the techniques that uh, is common to this field is called bounding box detection. How does active learning relate to bounding box concept? Right. So, yeah, like I said, we're, we're focused on a fairly easy task here of um, a, single, a single label for an image. But for a lot of cases, you want to do something more sophisticated. So you want to look, um, you know, not just categorize an image, but identify some segment within an image. Um, so whether that's a, a bounding box or, or maybe a polygon um, uh, surrounding an image. Uh, so look for text analysis. You might want to apply um, machine learning uh, to provide a label to an entire piece of text, or you might want to identify key phrases or, or name entities uh, within text. Uh, pretty much everything that I um, demonstrated here today uh, would apply for to, to these slightly more complicated tasks. Um, and uh, often it's more important. So for, for bounded boxes, for the particular question that was asked, uh, this is one area where you get an incredibly large speed up uh, when people are evaluating machine learning output versus doing it themselves. Um, so you can imagine that, let's say you have a, um, a self-driving car company. Um, so we, uh, we work with the, uh, the majority of, of self-driving car companies here at, at CrowdFlowers. This is something that we see really often. Um, and you want to put bounding boxes around every pedestrian um, that, that a car is seen driving down the road. If you've got 40 pedestrians on that street, um, and you have a bounding box that your machine learning algorithm has put around them, uh, a human can very quickly look at that and say yes or no in a couple of seconds. Um, however, um, uh, the human saying yes or no is quick, but if you put that raw image in front of a human and ask them to, to carefully draw a bounding box around each of those 40 people, that could take several minutes. Um, so the, the differences here uh, between um, evaluating the machine learning output for new training data and creating raw data uh, can often be 100x uh, difference in efficiency, which is massive. Uh, but then in this particular use case, you really want to be careful about biasing your data as well. Because imagine you only have 39 bounding boxes around humans and one was missed. Um, there are some use cases in, in which you don't mind a little bit of noise in your data. Um, certainly for, for this use case of self-driving cars, um, you don't want to miss any potential pedestrians. Um, so this is um, the, uh, even better um, uh, potential benefits that you'll get, uh, but with the same caveat. So it will depend on your use case as to whether or not uh, you should apply that method. Well, Robert, thank you. Uh, and, and as a last question, uh, the audience has asked uh, if you can mention or point to some resources where they can uh, do further research or, or do uh, personal learning uh, in the area of active learning, both in text and image classification. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so a, a great starting point, uh, there are the links that we provided in, um, in the, the seminar here today. Um, we'll um, make sure that, that those are sent out to, to everyone uh, who has attended. Uh, also happy to, to augment those um, with either industry or academic papers um, uh, on the, the subject of, of active learning, um, depending on um, what's of interest uh, to the audience. Unfortunately, like I said, there's not a whole lot of, of work in this area. Um, but given how excited it is and that the intersection of, of, of human and AI processing, um, I hope that's something that we'll see change in the near future. Well, Robert, thank you. Uh, some great answers to some very good questions. Uh, and for those of you that asked questions that weren't answered today, uh, we'll be sending all the unanswered questions to Robert and the Crowdflower team so they can follow up with you after today's webinar. Now, I have just a, a few quick announcements. Uh, if you'd please mark your calendars for October 10th, that's our next DSC webinar, which will be Embedded AI, Machine Learning, and Analytics. Uh, to be sponsored by SAP. 
Also remember that today's uh, taping will be available for on-demand viewing if you'd like to review this topic later today, and you can find that on the home page of Data Science Central in the webinar tab located at the top of the page. Well, this brings today's webinar to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions, and a special thanks again to Crowdflower for their sponsorship, and particularly to our speaker today, Robert Monroe, uh, for his insight into today's topic. This is Bill Voorhees. Uh, I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event. I look forward to seeing you all again on October 10th. Have a great day. Thank you all.